Onto your headphones and pour your favorite beverage. It's time for the Kicking or Sticking Fantasy Football Podcast. Now, fresh off the sidelines, your host, Matt McPeak. Fantasy freaks and geeks, what is up? Welcome to the Keepers and Dynasty League edition of the Kicking or Sticking Fantasy Football Podcast. This is a fun episode. Got two guests lined up for this show. First guest is my OG co-host from back in the dear dudes and beer days, uh, Adam Natris. Thank you for joining the show. How's it going, bro? How are you? I'm good, guys. Good to be back. I'm happy to be here. Quarantined up talking about fantasy football. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I've uh, I've honestly kind of been enjoying this uh, this um, quarantine because I've just been doing nothing but fantasy stuff every single day. Obviously, with this podcast and uh, and with us starting a dynasty league, which we will get into uh, in a little bit. But we're going to start talking about keepers leagues. So, Adam, uh, I know you're in a couple keeper leagues, and uh, I know last year we we were talking a little bit about keepers, but just to kind of give a little intro uh, to some people that maybe don't know what a keepers league is. Basically, instead of redrafting your team every year from scratch, you and your fellow league mates um, get to keep a certain number of players from the previous year. Uh, The amount of players you can keep and the more importantly, what you lose in compensation for those players that you decide to keep drastically affects the decisions that you make as far as who you're going to keep. So uh, some leagues have limits on the amount of years you can keep a player uh, or you can keep players drafted. You can't keep players drafted in the first round, for example, all kinds of different rules. Um, Why do you want to start a keepers league? Well, if you're, uh, if you're getting a little bored of the whole redraft thing, but you, uh, but you don't want to dive headfirst into a full out dynasty league, this is the perfect medium, uh, you know, median ground there. So, um, So there's three basic ways that teams can decide on how they keep players. So there's the salary cap uh, where they base it off of years. So let's say your league has 15 roster spots per team with, let's say, 30 years worth of salary cap. After the draft, each team then assigns each player an amount of years. So obviously you want to give the most years to your best players, your young players, Um, and uh, you want to give the fewest years to your backups and the older players. Um, You can set limits on how many years you can keep players and and all kinds of things. Um, The next format, which is probably usually the the most uh, common, is basically you just keep three or four guys or really any amount. Um, uh, This is simply, you know, you you just pick a certain number of players that you want to keep, and those are the guys that you keep. There's no penalties associated with it. You don't have to keep track of a a salary cap or anything. Uh, And you can also set limits on the maximum amount of years that you're allowed to keep players in that format. Um, I joined a uh, keepers league last year that you can keep one player. Um, and the way that we do it is really stupid, which again, we'll, we'll get into it in a minute. But, um, the third way, which is, I think the coolest way is, um, round penalties. So each member keeps a certain amount of players, but each player counts as a draft pick. So when you have your next draft, uh, you know, you lose certain picks depending on which players you end up keeping. Typically, if you keep a guy you drafted in the fifth round, you lose your fifth round pick. Or some leagues like to do, you know, if you draft a player in the fifth, you lose your fourth round pick. Um, you know, some leagues don't allow you to, to keep your first round pick. Some leagues allow um, that, let's say you, you add somebody in uh, free agency. Uh, that pick would then count towards your 15th round pick or whatever your last round pick is. Um so there are a lot of variations for this system, but it seems to me the most strategic from year to year is the round penalty system. So, Adam, let's get into some of these questions for you because you are the most experienced keeper league player that I know. So um, how does your league pick their sleepers? What system do you guys use? Do you have the round penalties? Do you have a salary cap? What's up? So we are the round penalty type. Uh, you get to keep three players. That Actually, that number had increased from two 
uh, over the past two years. But you get to keep three players, and you keep them for the round in which they were drafted. Now, that's the first year you keep them. You have a max of three seasons. Uh, and each progressive year, you keep them between the difference in which their projected draft number is and where you had them at. So, for example, on my team, I got Tyler Boyd in the 16th round. Um, Tyler Boyd was projected probably like the 8th round, I think, last year, maybe ninth. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got to keep him for – so that was, I think, the second time I – no, I'm sorry – so the first time I kept him, it was for the 16th. And then the next time I kept him would be for whatever the difference in projection is. So it might be an eighth. I mean, that would be if he's in the first round. So that's not the case. But Right. So it's probably like a 12th like or a 13th. 12th. Yeah. Yep. Right. Okay. Sorry about that. Sometimes I've been doing this league so long, I forget exactly who I've kept for how long and when. Right. We've recycled now plenty of times, um, which makes it interesting. So you're Le'Veon Bell's. Le'Veon came in at a ninth rounder. You can imagine how mad I was that he wasn't on my team. Right. So now um, you said three years is the maximum amount of years that you're allowed to keep a guy. Yep. After that, after that third year, he automatically goes back into the draft. Okay. And uh, so, what are your biggest decisions this year going into the 2020 draft? Um, what are who are the guys that you're contemplating keeping, and and what pick are you going to lose for keeping that player? So I, I already highlighted the one, um, and I'm really going to so, – so Tyler Boyd for me is a interesting one. Uh, he'd be kept for a 12th. We all know Joe Burrow went there, and that you – know, Tyler Boyd is a fantastic number two receiver there. When A.J. Green is healthy, which he is finally, you know, Tyler Boyd seems to flourish with that. Well, And plus with Joe Burrow, it could be even more incredible. Um, obviously, it's a question mark because it's still Tyler Boyd. Right, and on top of that, they drafted in the second round T. Higgins. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And then you never know with a guy like Auden Tate, who's just that big and fast, if one year it clicks. Right. Yeah. So you know, people kind of slight him because of the T. Higgins draft. So Tyler Boyd and then John Ross is the speedster. So really, it's a big question mark. Um, but I'd be dumb to not say I would not think about it thoroughly because they did take Burrow. Uh, the next one is Miles Sanders. So yeah. I would keep Miles Sanders for a fourth round pick. Running backs are marquee uh, in my keeper league, as in most. And a guy like Miles, you know, there's going to be a lot of hype as it gets closer to the dra- to the season. I'm sure his stock will go up, but he is a running back on the Eagles. My Philadelphia Eagles do not use a single back running back since the likes of Shady 10 years ago. I don't expect that to change. Right. <laughs> Um, and you know, it's not a dynasty league, so I'd get him this year and next, and you'd have to hope for God that he would be that guy, right? So again, it's something you have to really think about. The fourth round pick is, is up there. Um, you know, in your fourth round is when you're really trying to fill your, ro- your, your core part of the roster. So do I want Miles Sanders effectively as my number two running back? Uh, and then the one I don't have to think about, I just like to brag about because of a coup I had made, a trade I made last year. For the likes of Aaron Jones, I get to keep Aaron Jones in the twelfth round. Nice. Yeah. So that I wanted to highlight as to why Miles Sanders is where I'm like, you know what? I might keep him for the fourth because I have Aaron Jones in the twelfth round. Yeah. Uh, and that, ladies and gentlemen, are my keeper questions and definitive facts with Aaron Jones going into this season. Yeah, that's a, I'm excited. That's a tough one too, especially with what the the uh, Packers did in the draft getting a running back in the, with the second pick. Um, you know, you got to figure that Aaron Jones is going to be a free agent going into next mm-hmm. season. So, um, you know, let's say he goes to a team like my New York football jets that could be really, really looking for a young running back. Um, yeah, that's pretty be fruitful for all. That would be exciting. So um, I want to go through my keep the keeper league that I joined last year. So, um, like I said, you only keep one guy, and as of right now, there's no rule to you know for a, a penalty for keeping the guy. Um, there's no salary cap or anything like that. So basically, whoever you decide to keep counts as your first round pick. Essentially, uh, the way we did it last year was everybody said who their first round said who their keeper was, and then we just started the draft. So um, 
I think it's kind of dumb. I asked the commissioner if we can change that up this year and use the round penalty, um, obviously, because I think it adds a whole nother layer of strategy. And obviously it rewards players or rewards owners who make really good picks, um, you know, at the back half of the draft. So um, here's my dilemma. Let's say hopefully all goes well and the commissioner does agree to uh, install the whole um, penalty system. Um, I got Lamar Jackson in the 10th round last year. Ooh, that's spicy. Yeah. So it's pretty much, uh, I'm pretty much deciding between him and, um, if they do a thing where, you know, if you add a player off of waivers, you can keep him as your last round pick. Um, I added Mark Andrews in the, uh, as a as a free agent last year, <laughs> I hate to re, I hate to rewash a word, but ooh, that is spicy. Yeah, I dude, like that. and especially in a standard league, it's not PPR. So and tight tight ends are uh, very difficult to come by. Right. So I I got Mark Andrews off waivers on October thirtieth. His bye week was in week eight, so it was right before his his uh, it was during his bye week. Um, when he was dropped after week seven, he was the number four tight end in half PPR, number three in standard, which, again, this is a standard scoring league. Um, and he finished the season as the number four tight end behind only Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, and Darren Waller in half PPR leagues. He was number two in standard. So, um, yeah, it's it, I, that's a it's a tough call, man. Do I take the what could be, again, the best quarterback with a 10th round or do I take what could be a top three tight end with my last pick of the draft? <laughs> Well, my personal opinion, if you're asking for this, is probably going to go against the grain, maybe. You never know with all these fantasy experts out there now. However, I think, and I firmly believe in the second year defensive coordinator, uh, what are we going to call it, a curse? Where the defensive coordinators somewhat figure out a little bit better how to defend them so they're not quite as prolific. Of course, we've seen guys completely blow that to smithereens. But the reason I bring that up is because I still think it's too hard to find a good tight end. There's a pl- you know, there's a handful out there that do it consistently. Yeah. And but it's tough to pass on Lamar Jackson for a 10. So I did not help you at all. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Yeah, yeah from, I don't want my opinion to be wrong on that one. From when I added him, uh, you know, after week from week 9 on, he had uh both of his 100 plus yard receiving games were in week 1 and 2. Uh, he didn't have another one all season, but he did have seven touchdowns in seven games, including two in the fantasy playoffs in week 15, which we'll talk about in a minute. Another interesting thing. Uh, but yeah, man, uh, Mark Andrews was a stud last year, and that's going to be a really tough decision for me, depending on how that rule goes. So another interesting player for keepers leagues is Kenyon Drake, who was... Um, last year, you know, with the Dolphins, he was trash, and I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of a lot of guys dropped him after the first couple games of the season. So in our league, he was drafted in the eighth round by our commissioner. Uh, he was dro- dropped uh, after week, I think it was week four that he was dropped. Um, he only had 75 total yards on 17 touches in the first two weeks, so he did not come off to a good start. Um, and then after sitting on the waiver wire from weeks three to five, I added Kenyon Drake uh, on October 28th at 7 a.m., which was the Monday of week seven. Uh, even though they had a buy coming up in week eight, I heard rumors that he might get traded, so I was like, screw it, I'm just going to add this dude and see where he ends up going. Um, luckily, he goes to the Cardinals, and they played um, – on that next Thursday night in week nine, which was Halloween, actually. Uh, And in his first game with the Cardinals, Drake had his third best game of the year with 162 total yards on 15 carries, caught four passes. Uh, It was the most touches that he had all year up to that point. Um, And he scored a rushing touchdown. So um, I couldn't figure out how to... Right, dude? So I, I couldn't figure out how to go back and look at week nine score on Yahoo. One of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of Yahoo, but uh, I'm pretty sure I did not start him, but I still won by 24 and a half points. I did go back and look at the scores and I did win that week. So thankfully I wasn't screwed that week, um, but this is where it gets interesting. So then over weeks 10 and 12, he only averaged 5.7 fantasy points per game in standard leagues again. Um, so I dropped him December 4th, right before week 13. Um, he then had another pretty pedestrian game in week 13, but in week 14, 
he had the best game of his career with 146 <laughs> total yards and four touchdowns versus Cleveland. Um, he won my league. To did he? Fair. I'm sure yep. he won a lot of people's leagues. Yep. That's um, why I, this is a familiar path you're taking as well, unfortunately. <laughs> So he was then added on December 18th going into week 15 and the fantasy playoffs uh, by, get this, the same dude who drafted him, the commissioner of the league. He ended up with the number one seed. I ended up with the number two seed. And wouldn't you know it, the two of us met in the fantasy championships where Kenyon Drake had another huge game, 184 total yards and two touchdowns that week. Um Luckily for me, Lamar Jackson threw three touchdowns and rushed for 103 yards. Uh, yeah. Mark Andrews had that big 93-yard, two-touchdown game that I talked about earlier. Uh, Marlon Mack had over 100 yards and a touchdown, and Devontae Adams had 116 yards that week. So, luckily, I still okay. won. Yeah, I, I, dude, I was sweating it, though, bro. I was, I was worried. Because also, if you remember, I had Dalvin Cook uh, on my team as well, who was the number two running back going into Week 16, only behind Christian McCaffrey. Um, and, uh, and I had his handcuff as well, Alexander Madison, and neither of them played week 16. Mike Boone got the start in week 16. Um, and I also had Zeke Elliott who was, who he had his second worst game of the year in week 16. So I would have been so incredibly pissed at myself if I lost because I dropped Kenyon Drake. But, um, this brings up a big point. Um, you know, like I said, the commissioner, he's kind of in a bind here because depending on how he makes the rules for our keepers, will pretty much determine whether or not he gets probably the best value keeper this year. You know, it's does he make it, um, you know, you keep a player based on where they were drafted, even if it was someone that you added in free agency, which means he would keep him as his eighth round pick or it's, if, a, if you added somebody via free agency, uh, you get him for your last round pick. So Kenyon Drake, um, who could be a, a second round pick this year in standard leagues could be kept for a 15th round pick, which I think that's probably the best. That's probably even a better value than Lamar Jackson in the 10th or Mark Andrews in the 15th. Would you agree? Yeah, a hundred percent. And can I, can I tell you, we started out our keeper league really just like that, where free agent ad got put as the last round, you know what I mean? For years is 15th. Ours was a 16th. Uh, things happened. Someone made a mistake. Your boy ended up with Julio at the 16th round. Damn. Yeah. So after that, we immediately said no. If the player was drafted in this round, it doesn't matter how he got onto your team. That is what you keep him for. So wait, Unless someone, he's already been kept. So. Someone in your league dropped Julio Jones? Yep. What? This was early on. Forgot it was a keeper league. I actually was not the one who picked him up. Someone else had picked him up, and I orchestrated a trade. Dude, I don't care. For him. I don't care what kind of league it is. It's Julio <laughs> Jones, bro. What the and, hell? And, and this was prime Julio years too. Yeah, so right. We called it Julio Gate, uh, mainly because I got to keep him in the end for 16th round. And <laughs> that's awesome. You, you know, it's an outlier situation. I know, but it can happen. Right. Uh, which makes situations just you know you got a Kenyon Drake situation. I highly advise to try and push for the draft by round. Okay. And then that way, if someone gets a good ad in free agency from a guy that wasn't drafted, well, God bless him. Right. Again, um, that's David Johnson two years ago. Yeah, that's a good call. Uh, a couple other picks that kind of stood out to me. We'll kind of wrap it up with this because uh, I got that an- another call with another another guest coming up right up after this. Um, Chris Godwin in the sixth round. Uh, Kareem Hunt and DJ Moore in the ninth round. Your boy Miles Sanders in the tenth round, uh, Christian Kirk in the thirteenth round, Emmanuel Sanders in the fourteenth round, and Kyler Murray in the fifteenth round. So um, I think the league is pretty motivated to go with the um, with the whole round penalty thing because, as you can see, there's a whole lot of really good players that were taken at the back half of the draft. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the commissioner, um, you know. Hopefully he puts that rule into place. So with that, Adam, uh, I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on the podcast. It's good to have you back on. Anytime I can get you get you back on the show is always good. And, um, yeah, thanks for coming on, bro. Awesome. Great to be back, you know. Good luck to everybody. So uh, we are now going to – I'm going to drop in the phone call with our next guest. Um, we're going to be talking about Dynasty. So sit tight for just a minute. All right, so I am here with Evan Parker, the commissioner of the Hoot Rooters League. 
a 12-team full PPR that I have won twice. Thank you very much. Uh, Evan was gracious enough to allow me to join, even though we have never met. And it's been, what, six years now, Evan? Six, yeah, I think just about six years now. Yeah, and we, we have still yet to meet, man. What the hell? We got to get a live draft one of these years. I know. I was, I, I'm, planning, I'm planning on it. Hopefully we can get one soon. That would be sweet. So, uh, so thanks for coming on the podcast. What's up, man? How's how's this stupid ass virus treating you? You know, uh, I'm living in Florida, so it's 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 almost like it's not too bad at the moment. But mm-hmm. I do have family living up uh, in Pennsylvania and Ohio, so I know it's getting it's pretty serious up there. So we're just all trying to make the best of the situation. I'm just working from home. Cool. Um, I just I just moved in to a house literally the week before everyone had to hunker down. So I'm, I'm thankful that I've been in my house instead of my apartment. Yeah. Right. And then you're in the Miami area or Tampa, Uh, Tampa, Tampa Bay. Cool. Sweet, man. Well, uh, honestly, I'm just hoping that we get baseball back. I've, I'm hoping that football will be okay by freaking August, but, uh, yeah, this not having any baseball is really, really killing me. So, uh, well, cool, man. I appreciate you coming on, and uh, I appreciate you coming on to talk about Dynasty football. So um, last year, I was not very happy. Uh, not only did you and a bunch of the other Hoot Rooters start a Dynasty League without me, but uh, you guys bailed on my all-IDP league. So you broke my heart. I don't appreciate it. Uh, I, I got to get you back for one of those, but uh, no, I'm just playing. Um, but yeah, let's talk about your dynasty league. So, what was your strategy um, going into your the startup draft, your your initial draft last year? Well, uh, Matt, first off, um, this league kind of started started out just me talking with a couple friends in Tampa, and after after it gained a little bit of interest, I asked my my friends here in Florida. Uh, if they wanted to join the league and after that I only had about three or four spaces so I texted the guys I've known longer in our Hoot Rooters League before (laughs) I texted you trust me I would have invited you into this league but I'm um, just breaking your balls bro it's all good I totally get it but uh yeah so this dynasty uh league I made I, I was just listening to a few podcasts and it sounded uh sounded pretty interesting and it, it's a PPR, full PPR, super flex league. So my strategy going in with the, uh, with the fourth pick, I knew the only thing I knew I wanted in this draft was Patrick Mahomes or Lamar Jackson. Mm-hmm. I figured if I'm going to be keeping up with this league as long as I've kept up with my other league, I want to watch someone I enjoy watching for those few years. For those at, at least six, I'm hoping this goes longer than six, though. Mm-hmm. So, with this being a super flex, I had Patrick Mahomes ranked as the number one guy, and he fell to me at the fourth spot. So I took Mahomes, and my strategy following that was just stick to my rankings. I usually do tier based rankings, which I just I tried and I, I did enough mock drafts that I thought I could get a low end running back one and wide receiver one on the uh, second and third round. And after that, it's just building uh, a good team of youth and veterans. If you go entirely youth, your team's probably going to be pretty bad the first couple years of the dynasty. And let's face it, we all want to win when we're playing fantasy football. Hell yeah. Yeah, that Lamar Jackson. So last year I was in six leagues, and I think I had Lamar in five of them. The only one I didn't have him in was the Hoot Rooters, and you picked him the pick before me. So good on you. Uh, I'm sure you ended up doing pretty well, just like I did in all my leagues with Lamar. He is uh, he is definitely, to me, in this Dynasty League, uh, if I have the opportunity to get, like you said, either one of them, I'm going to take him. Um, and honestly, I'll probably try and get both of them if I can, just because of that whole, the whole super flex thing, which, uh, thank you for recommending that because, um, it was a big, uh, it was a big thing with, with the rest of the guys in, in my dynasty startup is, you know, do we do the two QB or do we do the super flex thing? And, uh, I, we, we kind of sided more towards the versatility of the super flex and, um, you know, I, I brought up 
one guy that was like, oh, it's so stupid. Everyone's going to be playing a quarterback in the super flex anyway. But you brought up how the gentleman that won your league played a wide receiver in his super flex the entire year. So uh, that just kind of goes to show that just because it's super flex doesn't mean you got to keep a quarterback in that second spot all year long. So um, how did you uh, how did you um, geez, I just lost my spot in my extensive notes. OK, um, how, what was your strategy with your throughout the year with your waiver wire and, and you know, your, your trades? I know you made at least one trade because you ended up with an extra uh, an extra pick in the rookie draft. But how did you approach the waiver wire in your dynasty league as opposed to your redraft leagues? So something that we did this year in the dynasty that I've never done before. <clears throat> Excuse me. We usually do rolling waivers in our other league, but this year I introduced FOB, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> which if I'm sure you know what FOB is. Oh yeah. Free. Uh, what is it? Free agent acquisition bucks. Yes. Right. So we did a, we did a hundred, hundred dollars FOB for the year for every team. So the way I went about waivers was just I, I would rather catch a big fish than a bunch of small fish. So I sat on my money, and when I thought the opportunity was right, I dropped a lot more fob into a player than than other people would, mm-hmm. just so I know I got my guy. What's what's one player that kind of stands out if you can remember uh, somebody that you added, uh, you know, during the season in your dynasty league uh, on the waiver wire. Oh, last season I added uh, Darius Slayton. There you go. Team. That's a good one. Yeah, for sure. Nice young guy too. I know. Yeah. I mean, I can't believe he. I I honestly looked and I couldn't believe that he was still on a free agent, especially this being Dynasty and we have a twenty-person roster. So I I unloaded to get him. Right. Nice, nice ad by you, dude. He should be. Uh... I don't know if he'll be the number one there in New York, but he should definitely see plenty of targets. And uh, I think that New York Giants offense is going to be better than what uh, what people are expecting him to be. I know that's probably not what you want to hear as an Eagles fan, but um, so let's let's transition over to your rookie draft this past this year. Um, how did you approach that rookie draft? Tell us about um, that trade you made to acquire that fourth pick in your rookie draft, uh, and give us some of the guys that you added. So I so there was actually quite a few quite a few trades in this draft um, with the whole coronavirus. We didn't know when we were going to do, be doing the rookie draft, but I thought after the NFL draft, I was I thought maybe giving it two weeks, three weeks, uh, and talking with the rest of the league, they they thought it was good as well. So what we ended up doing was put no time limit on the draft and starting it on a Friday night, and it lasted three full days so there was a lot of movement so the first pick i made uh was the 103 and i was at the 104 to begin with wow nice um so i moved up one spot and got clyde edwards hilaire which i thought was the best running back and the best player in this rookie draft um and then i the, the trade I made was uh, was a guy who had the 101 and the 103. So he also gave me the 201 in the trade uh, in the trade back. Nice. So from the two, from the 201, I moved up. Um, my running backs are, are pretty bad in this in this uh, dynasty league I have. So I, I knew I wanted to get a couple running backs, and Cam Akers fell to the 109. So I gave. I gave the call when he was at the 109 spot and moved up with uh, two second rounders, the 201, uh, my next year's second rounder, and Tyler Higby. I thought I had, I thought I could make that move just because I have two first round picks in next year's draft as well. Now, when you made that trade, um, or when you made that pick of Cam Akers, was uh, what other running backs were still available? If you remember, was Jonathan Taylor still available? No, so this being super flex, the first pick was uh, Joe Burrows. Okay. And then the second pick was Jonathan Taylor. Right. And uh, after that, when I got Clyde, it was a mix of running backs and, cor- and the two uh, top six quarterbacks. 
until uh, the 108, where I thought Cam Akers was going to go. But they ended up going with C.D. Lamb. Okay. So so Cam Akers, the only running backs that were still on the board was uh, Vaughn from Tampa Bay, Zach Moss, A.J. Dillon. And I thought that I thought that this this year's rookie rookie uh, running backs had a clear clear tier tier one and two of those top five guys, and then after that, I saw a pretty big drop off. Nice, yeah, I, I like Cam Akers, man. I think he's going to be awesome in that zone rushing scheme that they run in uh, in L.A. Um, is he the next Todd Gurley? I don't know, but he looks like he's it's going to be a perfect fit for him there. So. Um, how did you guys decide on your rookie draft order? Was it just the inverse of um, the st- the the finishing standings, or, or how did you guys go about that? Yeah, so we did the inverse of the standings. Okay. Correct. And, and, uh, and like I and like I said earlier, the so the guy who ended up winning didn't have a, a single pick until the three point twelve. We do we do third uh, three rounds, and he actually one last year starting for wide receivers the entire season wow and he traded his first two rookie draft picks uh for i'm assuming some veterans to try and win now i I guess yes nice cool man um one thing that uh reading up about and and, uh and doing some research I, i the supplemental draft this year could throw a huge mucky wrench into dynasty leagues especially uh, when you consider guys like trevor lawrence or um, demorne chase uh, with lsu uh, possibly being available on your waiver wire for teams that have already had their rookie draft so um, did you guys talk about that do you have any plans in place for how you're going to deal with let's say um, the supplemental draft comes around and guys like Trevor Lawrence look at the situation and they say, hey, there's no guarantee that there's going to be a college season, so I'm just going to declare in the supplemental draft and, and you know, whatever happens, happens. Yeah, so we did discuss the possibility of the college season not happening and there being a supplemental draft and the NFL getting this influx of young talent who probably would have been the top or some of the top picks in this year's rookie draft. And our, what we would end up doing is adding a two-round supplemental draft to our uh, league and doing uh, a completely random randomized order. Cool. So I like we usually, that. We, we, usually would, we usually would be doing a linear draft for the supplemental, but in this case, we would do a snake draft. Okay. Very cool, man. Well, hey, do you have any other tips for the listeners who might be either starting a dynasty league or uh, might be going into their first rookie draft? Any tips at all that you have for the listeners? Yeah, I uh, just just remember this is a dynasty league and this is your team. So just try and make it your own. If you think you're reaching on somebody, but he's not going to make it back to you you're going to have plenty of chances later on in the draft to get a sleeper. So I would say make the pick. A lot of people thought that making the Patrick Mahomes pick was dumb. I, it may have been in hindsight because I could have got Lamar Jackson in the fifth round, but I say just make your team your own and know who you want as a late draft sleeper. Um, because with 20 round with 20 rounds, uh, when you start to get to that bottom of the list, you're really just trying to pick a couple young guys who might flourish. Right. Yeah, I dude, I got no problem taking Patrick Mahomes, especially number four overall in a super flex. I would assume he'd be the first one to get off go off the board. But you know, the you, if when you're set at quarterback, it just makes playing fantasy football so much easier because you don't have to worry about constantly streaming that QB spot or or playing somebody like my boy Sam Darnold or somebody like that. So um So awesome, man. Well, again, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, make sure that uh, you guys check out the podcast next week. Um, We're going to be breaking down what is the topic for next week. I don't even remember. I think we're going to be talking about tight end and running back parlay tickets. I hit on a whole bunch of of tight end anytime scoring touchdown parlays last year, and I want to share that with you guys. So... Uh, again, Evan, thanks for joining the podcast. Thanks also to, to 
Adam Natris, who joined us earlier. And as always, may the fantasy gods be cruel to your opponents. You have been listening to the Kickin' or Stickin' Fantasy Football Podcast. For more great episodes and information, follow us on social media and tune in every week. Kickin' or Stickin' is available on Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Alexa, Reach.tv, or your favorite podcast service. Kickin' or Stickin' is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. To find out more about this and other great shows on our network, visit us online at hcuniversalnetwork.com today. Fantasy football is fun, but gambling addiction destroys lives. If you or someone you love suffers from gambling addiction, please do not be afraid to seek help. The National Council on Problem Gambling operates the National Problem Gambling Helpline Network. Contact them today at one 800 522-4700. Thank you for tuning in to the Kickin' or Stickin' Fantasy Football Podcast. Please remember to play responsibly and always look for your man downfield. Uh, uh, uh.